Uh, you know about the estate sale um, that's uh, taken place recently. The, the fourth estate has been sold. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's really bad news, folks. Uh, you remember the origin of that, maybe some of you. Uh, Edmund Burke getting up uh, in Parliament, where there were three houses of Parliament at the time, and saying, yeah, I'm privileged to be here with these statesmen and statesmen in those days. Uh, but by far more important is the fourth estate. You men of the press up there in the balcony because you keep our democracy safe. You report our doings here. Without you, the bets would be off. He said a little differently than bets would be off, but he meant it and so did Jefferson who said, as you probably remember, if it's a choice between a free press and a government, I'll take a free press. So that's gone. The fourth estate is moribund, if not dead. That goes for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal in spades. Good news is that there's a fifth estate. Now, guess where the fifth estate is? Internet. Right. Social media. Where, whatever you, the ether, I don't know where it is, but it's there. And it's really important. And it's our job to make sure that that substitutes in a realistic and powerful way for what our fellow citizens are not getting uh, from the fourth estate. Uh, one of the trade secrets that I, uh, that I admit to in talks like this, this is not to leave this room, <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's this mystique about classified intelligence and uh, I'm here to tell you that back when I was working, 50, 40, 30, 20 years ago, 80% of the information we needed, generally speaking, on a given country or issue was available in public media. 80%. Now it's over 90%. And the practitioners admit to that. Now what does that mean? That means that uh, when reporters go to the CIA PR people and say, well, this McGovern said that, well, you know, and they say, well, what does he know? He, he retired so many years ago, he can't possibly know the secrets, right? He can't possibly be filled in. It also means that, uh, you know, we really have a terrific advantage over the times uh, gone by. You know, in the morning, I always, uh, even though I can sleep in sometimes, I always wake up for eight o'clock to watch Amy Goodman. I mean, you know, that is far and away the best source of information to start your day with. Even if I'm really tired, I do that, okay? And not only do I get 10, 15, 20 minutes of straight news, I learn all kinds of things that I should know about, that we all should know about. And I tell these kids in, in college where I lecture that, uh, you know, if they, if they can't get up that early, you can get it any time of the day on the web. So, um, I uh, was thinking about history, and I was thinking about uh, George Bush, George W. Bush, and uh, you know his attitude toward history. Do you remember what he said when someone said, "Well, well have you thought about your your place in history?" Anybody remember his response to that? Well, I'll be dead. No yeah, <laughs> who cares? Well, I'll be I'll be dead. <laughs> There's something underneath that that's really, really, really powerful and very, very distressing. Um, he has his library. When I was a kid, I used to say library. I now know it's a library, but his is a library, okay? <laughs> and it's gonna happen a couple of weeks from now, right, Ann? Ann's gonna be there, I'm gonna be there by Skype. A whole bunch of people who know about the lies are going to expose them to anybody in Dallas who's, who's got ears to hear are going to be there. Why? Because history is really important. And there's a faux history out there that the young people or old people believe. For example, I'm talking at a college in New Jersey just three weeks ago, okay? And a history professor is there and we're talking about the origins of the war on Iraq. And uh, I, you know, I said, well, it wasn't weapons of mass destruction, clearly. It wasn't 
ties between Al Qaeda and, and Iraq, and, and we know that that was not a mistake. Th those that was fraud, out and out fraud. Okay, the Senate Intelligence Committee, after five years of investigating, in a bipartisan report, said that that information given before the Iraq War was unsubstantiated, contradicted, or even non-existent, end quote. Are you tell me what non-existent intelligence looks like, <laughs> folks. You know what it looks like? Forgery, yellow cake forgeries, making up stuff, distorting things, aluminum tubes, the whole nine yards. It was fraud. It wasn't a mistake, okay? Now, the other thing is, so, so, I, so I said, well, so why do you think uh, we went into Iraq? And, uh, well, the professor rose to the occasion. He said, well, the Saddam wouldn't let the inspectors in. Jesus, <laughs> professor. So I suppressed my instant reflection and said, I'm glad you asked that a question, you know? Uh, and I deferred it. But then I pointed out that actually, you know, <laughs> he did. Uh -huh. Uh, oh yeah, right at the very end, like a couple days before we invaded. No, no, no. Actually, it was sort of. It was the end of November, so they were the end of November, December, January, February, half of March, um, and they didn't find anything. Why do you think it was because they didn't let the inspectors in? Oh well, that's what uh, the, the, the president said. Indeed, President Bush said that at least three times to a very distinguished interviewer, and the interviewer said, oh, okay, let's go to the next question. It's that bad, folks. It's that bad. If you don't remember, back at, in late 2002, it was all supposed to be a trick. Uh, and actually, it's referred to in those downing Hussein. That's what Jack Straw, the British foreign minister, said. We were going to propose such a rigorous, such a restrictive inspection regime that he, he would reject it out of hand. And guess what? He said, OK, come on in. Come on into my palaces. Uh, quiz my, uh, my engineers and scientists one on one. Uh, you could have the run of the place. And they did, OK? And they found nothing. So these lies are, are going to be rife, and it's going to be up to uh, uh, to professors of law and teachers of law, uh, I'm sorry, history, to, uh, to make them correct. Um, in th three years, we're going to be, two years now, we'll be celebrating the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. We talked about habeas corpus here, okay? Now, you historians, I will be writing scholarly articles and books about how uh, this practice of habeas corpus was, was fought for by these uh, rather wealthy British barons who didn't like the notion that they could be wrapped up and put in jail without uh, any due process. And, uh, but then, uh, a couple of years ago, during the War on Terror, that was judged to be arcane and uh, outmoded and obsolete and uh, sort of quaint. And so that went by the board, and now we have a different regime. <laughs> My God! My God! Now, I confront you because the prostitutes are not doing it. The journalists aren't doing it. And so, in addition, in addition to your teaching chores, and you're writing books and articles, Make sure you write articles that people can read and you put on the web and we can have Amy Goodman cite them and we can put them on Consortium News or Truth Out or, or these kinds of things. So, so there's a fair chance that people who really know history, like you guys, instead of people who kind of know 50 years worth, I can put these, these things into perspective. It's really so necessary. Um, I, uh, very early on when I was asked to explain why we went on into Iraq. Actually, I was on a plane going to Alaska. I remember it quite well. I said, I need a pithy way to, to say this. And I came up with uh, uh, an acronym, O-I-L. 
Now, I got in a lot of trouble with John Stewart for that. You know, he said, McGovern, you're violating the rules for acronyms. You can't have an acronym that means the first letter of what you're you get. That's against the rules for acronyms. But you know, I was delighted. He gave me 10 minutes. I wasn't there in person, but he had my little sign up, you know, OIL for 10 minutes. Wow. And he, he acknowledged it was oil, Israel, and logistics. I had to find an L, logistics for the permanent military bases, okay? Now, when I mentioned before Congress, Israel, uh, these very progressive uh, Democratic uh, representatives, he sort of froze up. I looked at them and I said, well, McGovern, C-SPAN's on, you know, CNN's on. This is your chance. Be an intelligence officer. Don't be a lackey. And so I said, you know, I see you're freezing up here because I said that the U.S. and Israel means to dominate that part of the world. Don't you, don't you see it? Don't you see it? Um, and you keep referring to Israel as our ally. Don't you know that Israel is not our ally? Don't you know that? <laughs> They're really freezing up, you know, it's really it's frozen. And so I said, you know, we, we uh, talk about allies, and certainly there's certain shared values, but to be an ally, you need a mutual defense treaty. Look it up in Webster's, okay? And there is no mutual defense treaty with Israel, between us and Israel. And why? Well, we offered them one back after the Arabs did attack Israel back in... Uh, 1967 was... 73. 73, right, sorry, wow. In 73, uh, Kissinger sort of, uh, Soto Voce said, well, you know, we, we don't want this to happen again. The best guarantee against that would be to do a little mutual defense treaty. And then the Israelis said, well, thanks very much, but no thanks. And uh, our guys said, well, you don't want to be uh, an ally? Well, no. Um, why? Why do you suppose that would be? I mean, you're a, a country besieged as Israel can legitimately claim to be. Why would they not want a treaty with the United States? Yeah. Would it require fixed boundaries? Yeah, right. They'd have to. <laughs> where, where are the boundaries of Israel, right? You have to have that in a treaty. Thanks. Another reason is, well, what benefit would they get from having a, a juridical treaty when they enjoy all the privileges and more, uh, even without a treaty? Treaties bind each party to sort of let the other know if they're going to attack a country, you know, like, uh, so if Israel wanted to attack Lebanon or Syria or do some damage in Jordan or Gaza, uh, they would be sort of, there's a implicit at least uh, recognition that you don't do that without notifying your ally beforehand, okay? And they don't want that either. You know, uh, some, some people, some wags say that the real reason uh, that uh, when somebody asked to make uh, or suggested making Israel the, the 51st state, <laughs> and Israel just rejected it out of hand, the, the reason they gave was, uh, well, then we'd only have two senators. <laughs> now, it's, it's a dicey proposition to uh, talk uh, in these terms about Israeli influence here. Uh, I'm a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, sort of adjunct or associate member, but I think they do great work. And so it's really, impo it's really not right to generalize completely, but to deny the influence of the neocons the neoconservatives, and I was brought up short very early in Iraq because I was referring to the neocons as being responsible for these uh, ill-fated policies, and I got criticized in, I think it was called The Thinker, one of these uh, Zionist publications. They said, Mama McGovern's using a code word. He's using a code word. And I read on. Yeah, he, when he says neocons, he means Jews. And I... You know, naive as I was in those days, 10 years ago, I said, well, I did a list of the neocons, <laughs> and 80% of them were, were Jewish. And so I said, wow, you know? Uh, yeah, I suppose I mean that most of the neocons are Jewish. That doesn't mean that most of the Jews are neocons, right? There's a big difference there. 
So I learned a, a lesson from that, and what I want to do is just uh, kind of not take too much more time, but but tell you that the New York Times, I'm from New York, okay, and uh, my mother and father wouldn't go to bed at night without reading the New York Times. My Irish grandmother would say, black and white, okay, between the lines as well as the lines themselves. And uh, it's, it's no longer all the news that's fit to print. It's a distortion for the most part, and nowhere was this clear, clearer. I bought this getting on a plane, I forget where, on Monday, November the 29th, 2010. Now, what's the story here? The story here is that uh, WikiLeaks had just given a big trove of State Department cables, like I think 250,000 of them. The Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, and uh, Spiegel, I think, were the ones also in receipt of this. So was there an option for the Times to clamp down on this? No, competition made them print it. Well, they had several weeks, and what did they do? They picked out stories, some of them really uh, strange, all having to do with sharp distress over a nuclear Iran. On page one, the U.S., there's a path to a long-range missile. For the first time, the U.S. believes that Iran obtained advanced missiles from North Korea. Okay? Now, I'm just going to, you can't really see this very, very much, but I'm going to show you. There's the first page, okay? And I've underlined all the things that have to do with Israel. The point is that they picked, cherry-picked all the reports that they could expose or distort to show how much the Arabs are afraid of Iran, uh, how much the, uh, oh, look at that picture of uh, Ahmadinejad. Is he a bad looking guy or what? Is that photoshopped? I mean, he's got the whole military there from Iran be behind him, you know? Yeah, it reminds me, <laughs> any of you remember Porgy and Bess? Yeah. Okay, I have a little ditty here. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, to say he is bad is the Fed. He threatened to zap Israel right off the mat, that kid Ahmadinejad. But that ain't necessarily so. <laughs> that ain't necessarily so. Okay? It ain't necessarily so. And as you know, even though our president keeps saying that Ahmadinejad or the Iranians tried to wipe, wipe Israel right off the mat. It ain't. That's just, it ain't so. He didn't say that. Even the deputy, and many of you probably don't know this, the deputy prime minister of Israel, Mary Dor, was, inter was interviewed by a gutsy Al Jazeera fellow. Okay. And the Al Jazeera guy says, "But, but, uh, but, you know, Ahmadinejad never said that, right?" And so memory to us says, all right, so he never said that. All right, doesn't really matter. He's a bad guy anyway. You know? So the deputy prime minister of Israel admits that Ahmadinejad didn't say that. The trans Even the New York Times said that was a really bad translation of what he said. And uh, the president and the others keep doing that. Okay. Now, the thing I really want to point out to you here is that thing on the lower left as you're looking at it. See those missiles? Yes. Those missiles, I think I can bring them up here. Those missiles were said to be, no, oh, it's probably locked. Okay. 19 missiles from North Korea to Iran. <coughs> and they're pictured here in this parade in the Pyongyang's equivalent of Red Square. Now, uh, <laughs> The Russians, who were supposed to have designed these missiles, uh, talked to us in this cable that was released in WikiLeaks and said, what do you mean about these 19 missiles? We, we don't know, do, do they have these? We don't know of the existence of these missiles. Uh, and, and certainly they've never been tested. And so are you sure about that? <laughs> it's the most bizarre cable. The New York Times just printed the, the threatening picture, okay, saying these were very threatening things. Nineteen of them have, have been given to Iran, which is all made out of whole cloth. The ones in the parade are probably dummies, okay? 
So the Russians themselves in this cable are saying, give us a break, you know? We know about it. We know about North Korean missiles. We know nothing like this has ever been tested. We've never seen it in photography. Are you sure they exist? It's rather odd that you would be thinking that Iran would buy 19 untested missiles from Iran. So, you know, the whole thing is, is uh, just very, very, very terrible. Now, I want to finish up here by saying that uh, there are a lot of people that read this newspaper and still think they're getting the truth. And that comes up in all kinds of ways. I even went back to my 50th anniversary or 50th reunion at Fordham College three years ago or so. And Jack Keane, General Jack Keane, former Deputy Chief of Staff, U.S. Army, who was responsible for military input to the surge, which is yet another can you just get that? Uh, for the surge, okay? Now, the surge is, uh, everybody thinks it's a great thing. It was ethnic cleansing, mostly, folks. And uh, almost a 1,000 U.S. personnel died because of it. Um, so, he's making a presentation there. He's the five years younger than I am. And he says at the end of his presentation, so I'm going to Europe. When I leave here, I get go right to John Kennedy Airport, and I'm going to tell those Europeans they really have to stop Iran from building these nuclear bombs that they're building. I raised my hand, and I said, uh, "Well, um, are you unaware of the? Uh, are you unaware of the?" There's the menacing missile. It, it, on their website, it appears in bloody red color there on the tip. Iran has bought 19 advanced missiles from North Korea, according to a February 25 diplomatic case. That's from WikiLeaks. In the parade in October, North Korea displayed what some experts, you know, some oh, experts, yeah. said appeared to be the same kind of missiles. So I just want to show you how how uh, terrible that looks. So Jack Keane says that Iran's building nuclear weapons. It's very clear. And uh, so I raised my hand. I said, are you not familiar with the, uh, with the unanimous uh, US national intelligence estimate of November 2007 that says Iran stopped building a nuclear weapon at the end of 2003 and has not resumed work on a nuclear weapon? I know that, but uh, I, I have other information. <laughs> and I lost it. I said, that's a lie. Okay. And he, he, and he, didn't, uh, he didn't react in any way, but my friends did. Okay. And this is the point of why I, why, why I put this. Um, these are friends of mine, all right? I went to high school with some of them as well as college. And they had a certain... Uh, appreciation for me, I suppose, for certain respect. But it wasn't here. It wasn't in the New York Times. And here is Jack Keane, four-star general, telling him that Iran is working on a nuclear weapon. And so who are they, who are they going to believe? McGovern or the four-star general? And the New York Times. So people who have come to rely on this, and this happened to me yesterday as well at a funeral, and people said, well, how can you say that? It's not in the New York Times. Well, that's the story, folks, and what we need to do is, uh, is fix that. The last thing I'll say is this. There was a, my friend Colleen Rowley sent me this, and uh, I want to make sure I read it correctly to you because it's really dynamite. It has to do with 99% of the American people considering Iran the greatest threat to the United States. 99%, a poll done two months ago. Now, who's responsible for that? Our media is responsible for that. How do we get around that? We got to interest our students, our young people. We got to get help from them to 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 navigate the web, to put stuff up there in a way that's attractive and people will, will read it. Get them to watch Amy Goodman. Do something, but don't let this kind of thing stand. Thanks very much.